30 minutes of readings from the works of George Orwell, H.G. Wells, Edward Lear, Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, and the Venerable Bede. George Orwell was the pen name of Eric Arthur Blair, 25th of June 1903 to the 21st of January 1950. George Orwell is arguably the best chronicler of English culture in the 20th century. George Orwell, a down and out in Paris and London. Published by Victor Gallance on the 9th of January 1933. Chapter 30 Bozo had a strange way of talking, cocknified and yet very lucid and expressive. It was as though he had read good books, but had never troubled to correct his grammar. For a while, Paddy and I stayed on the embankment, talking, and Bozo gave us an account of the screeving trade. I repeat what he said, more or less in his own words. I'm what they call a serious screever. I don't draw in blackboard chalks like these others. I use proper colours, the same as what painters use. Bloody expensive they are, especially the reds. I use five bobs worth of colours in a long day, and never less than two bobs worth. Cartoons is my line, you know, politics and cricket and that. Look here. He showed me his notebook. Here's likenesses of all the political blokes what I've copied from the papers. I have a different cartoon every day. For instance, when the budget was on, I had one of Winston trying to push an elephant marked debt. And underneath it I wrote, Willy Budget. See? You can have cartoons about any of the parties, but you mustn't put anything in favour of socialism, because the police won't stand it. Once I did a cartoon of a boa constrictor marked Capital, swallowing a rabbit marked Labour. The copper came along and saw it, and he says, You rub that out and look sharp about it, he says. I had to rub it out. The copper's got the right to move you on for loitering, and it's no good giving them a back answer. I asked Bozo what one could earn at screeving. He said, This time of year, when it don't rain, I take about three quid between Friday and Sunday. People get their wages Friday, you see. I can't work when it rains. The colours get washed off straight away. Take the year round, I make about a pound a week, because you can't do much in the winter. Boat race day and cup final day, I've took as much as four pounds. But you have to cut it out of them, you know. You don't take a bob if you just sit and look at them. A halfpenny's the usual drop, and you don't even get that unless you give them a bit of back chat. Once they've answered you, they feel ashamed not giving you a drop. The best thing's to keep changing your picture, because when they see your drawing, they'll stop and watch you. The trouble is, the beggars scatter as soon as you turn round with the hat. You really want a knobber at this game. You keep at work and get a crowd watching you, and the knobber comes casual light round the back of them. They don't know he's the knobber. Then suddenly he pulls his cap off and you've gotten between two fires like. You'll never get a drop off real toffs. It's shabby sort of brokes you get most off and foreigners. I've had even sixpences off Japs and blackies and that. They're not so bloody mean as what an Englishman is. Another thing to remember is to keep your money covered up, except perhaps a penny in the hat. People won't give you anything if they see you've got a bob or two already. Bozo had the deepest contempt for the other screevers on the embankment. He called them the salmon platers. At that time there was a screever almost every 25 yards along the embankment, 25 yards being the recognised minimum between pitches. Bozo contemptuously pointed out an old, white-bearded screever 50 yards away. You see that silly old fool? He's been doing the same picture every day for 10 years. A faithful friend, he calls it. It's of a dog pulling a child out of the water. The silly old bastard can't draw any better than a child of ten. He's learned just that one picture by rule of thumb, like you learn to put a puzzle together. There's a lot of that sort out here. They come pinching my ideas sometimes, but I don't care. The silly sods can't think of anything for themselves, so I'm always ahead of them. The old thing with cartoons is being up to date. Once a child got his head stuck in the railings of Chelsea Bridge. Well, I heard about it, and my cartoon was on the pavement before they'd got the child's head out the railings. Prompt, I am. The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells 
1898. Book One. The Coming of the Martians. Chapter One. The Eve of the War. No one would have believed in the last years of the nineteenth century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might study the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days. At most, terrestrial men fancied there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds, as ours are to those of the beasts that perish, intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the twentieth century came the great disillusionment. The New Vestments There lived an old man in the kingdom of Tess who invented a purely original dress. And when it was perfectly made and complete, he opened the door and walked into the street. By way of a hat he'd a loaf of brown bread, in the middle of which he inserted his head. His shirt was made up of no end of dead mice, the warmth of whose skins was quite fluffy and nice. His drawers were of rabbit skins, so were his shoes. His stockings were skins, but it is not known whose. His waistcoat and trousers were made of pork chops, his buttons were jujubes and chocolate drops. His coat was all pancakes with jam for a border, and a girdle of biscuits to keep it in order. And he wore over all, as a screen from bad weather, a cloak of green cabbage leaves stitched all together. He had walked a short way when he heard a great noise of all sorts of beasticles, birdlings and boys. And from every long street and dark lane in the town, beasts, birdles and boys in a tumult rushed down. Two cows and a calf ate his cabbage-leaf cloak. Four apes seized his girdle, which vanished like smoke. Three kids ate up half of his pancakey coat, and the tails were devoured by an ancient he-goat. An army of dogs in a twinkling tore up his pork waistcoat and trousers to give to their puppies. And while they were growling and mumbling the chops, ten boys prigged the jujubes and chocolate drops. He tried to run back to his house, but in vain, for scores of fat pigs came again and again. They rushed out of stables and hovels and doors, they tore off his stockings, his shoes and his drawers, and now from the housetops with screechings descend, striped spotted white, black and grey cats without end. They jumped on his shoulders and knocked off his hat, when crows, ducks and hens made a mincemeat of that. They speedily flew at his sleeves in a trice, and utterly tore up his shirt of dead mice. They swallowed the last of his shirt with a squall, whereupon he ran home with no clothes on at all. And he said to himself as he bolted the door, I will not wear a similar dress any more, any more, any more, any more, never more. The Jumblies They went to sea in a sieve, they did, in a sieve they went to sea. In spite of all their friends could say, on a winter's morn, on a stormy day, in a sieve they went to sea. And when the sieve turned round and round, and every one cried, You'll all be drowned, they cried aloud, Our sieve ain't big, but we don't care a button, we don't care a fig, In a sieve we'll go to sea. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live, Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. 
They sailed away in a sieve, they did, in a sieve they sailed so fast. With only a beautiful pea-green veil tied with a ribbon by way of a sail to a small tobacco-pipe mast. And every one said who saw them go, Oh, won't they be soon upset, you know? For the sky's dark and the voyage is long, and happen what may, it's extremely wrong in a sieve to sail so fast. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. The water it soon came in, it did, the water it soon came in. So to keep them dry, they wrapped their feet in a pinky paper, all folded neat, and they fastened it down with a pin. And they passed the night in a crockery jar, and each of them said, How wise we are, though the sky be dark and the voyage be long. Yet we never can think we were rash or wrong, while round in our sieve we spin. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. And all night long they sailed away. And when the sun went down, they whistled and warbled a moony song to the echoing sound of a coppery gong, in the shade of the mountains brown. O oh, Timbaloo, how happy we are when we live in a sieve and a crockery jar, and all night long in the moonlight pale we sail away with a pea-green sail in the shade of the mountains brown. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. They sailed to the western sea, they did, to a land all covered with trees. And they bought an owl, and a useful cart, and a pound of rice, and a cranberry tart, and a hive of silvery bees. And they bought a pig, and some green jackdaws, and a lovely monkey with lollipop paws, and forty bottles of rainbow re, and no end of stilton cheese. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. And in twenty years they all came back, in twenty years or more, and every one said how tall they've grown, for they've been to the lakes and the terrible zone, and the hills of the Chankly Boar. And they drank their health, and gave them a feast of dumplings made of beautiful yeast, and every one said, if only we live, we too will go to sea in a sieve, to the hills of the Chankly Boar. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the jumblies live, their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. THE OWL AND THE PUSSYCAT The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money, wrapped up in a five-pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. O oh, lovely pussy! O oh, pussy, my love! What a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are! What a beautiful pussy you are! Pussy said to the owl, You elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing! Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows, and there in a wood a piggywig stood, with a ring at the end of his nose, his nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mince and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon, and hand in hand on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. Alfred the Great was a young man, of three and twenty years of age, when he became king. Twice in his childhood he had been taken to Rome, where the Saxon nobles were in the habit of going on journeys which they supposed to be religious. And once he had stayed for some time in Paris. Learning, however, was so little cared for then, that at twelve years old he had not been taught to read. Although of the sons of King Ethelwulf, he, the youngest, was the favourite. But he had, as most men who grow up to be great and good are generally found to have had, an excellent mother. And one day this lady, whose name was Osburga, happened, as she was sitting among her sons, to read a book of Saxon poetry. The art of printing was not known until long and long after that period, and the book which was written was what is called illuminated, with beautiful bright letters richly painted. The brothers admiring it very much, their mother said, I will give it to that one of you four princes who first learns to read. Alfred sought out a tutor that very day, applied himself to learn with great diligence, and soon won the book. 
He was proud of it all his life. This great king, in the first year of his reign, fought nine battles with the Danes. He made some treaties with them too, by which the false Danes swore they would quit the country. They pretended to consider that they had taken a very solemn oath, in swearing this upon the holy bracelets that they wore, and which were always buried with them when they died. But they cared little for it, for they thought nothing of breaking oaths and treaties too, as soon as it suited their purpose, and coming back again to fight, plunder and burn as usual. One fatal winter, in the fourth year of King Alfred's reign, they spread themselves in great numbers over the whole of England, and so dispersed and routed the king's soldiers that the king was left alone, and was obliged to disguise himself as a common peasant, and to take refuge in the cottage of one of his cowherds who did not know his face. Here, King Alfred, while the Danes sought him far and near, was left alone one day by the cowherd's wife to watch some cakes which she put to bake upon the hearth. But, being at work upon his bow and arrows, with which he hoped to punish the false Danes when a brighter time should come, and thinking deeply of his poor unhappy subjects, whom the Danes chased through the land, his noble mind forgot the cakes, and they were burnt. What? said the cowherd's wife, who scolded him well when she came back, and little thought she was scolding the king. You will be ready enough to eat them by and by, and yet you cannot watch them. Idle dog. William Shakespeare, Sonnet 18 Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, And every fair from fair sometime declines, By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, When in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. The following is an extract from An Ecclesiastical History of the English People by the Venerable Bede. The book was completed in 731, and this first chapter describes the islands of Britain as they were known during the time of Bede. The work was originally written in Latin, the language of religion of the time. The text used here is a translation believed to have been written in the early 20th century. Book 1. Chapter 1. Of the situation of Britain and Ireland, and of their ancient inhabitants. Britain, an island in the ocean, formerly called Albion, is situated between the north and west facing, though at a considerable distance, the coasts of Germany, France and Spain, which form the greatest part of Europe. It extends 800 miles in length towards the north, and is 200 miles in breadth, except where several promontories extend further in breadth, by which its compass is made to be 3,675 miles. To the south, as you pass along the nearest shore of the Belgic Gaul, the first place in Britain which opens to the eye is the city of Rutubi Portus, by the English corrupted into Reptacester. The distance from hence across the sea to Gesoriacum, the nearest shore of the Marini, is fifty miles, or, as some writers say, four hundred and fifty furlongs. On the back of the island, where it opens upon the boundless ocean, it has the islands called Orcades. Britain excels for grain and trees, and is well adapted for feeding cattle and beasts of burden. It also produces vines in some places, and has plenty of land and waterfowls of several sorts. It is remarkable also for rivers abounding in fish, and plentiful springs. It has the greatest plenty of salmon and eels. Seals are also frequently taken, and dolphins, as also whales. 
Besides many sorts of shellfish, such as mussels, in which are often found excellent pearls of all colours, red, purple, violet and green, but mostly white. There is also a great abundance of cockles, of which the scarlet dye is made, a most beautiful colour which never fades with the heat of the sun or the washing of the rain, but the older it is, the more beautiful it becomes. It has both salt and hot springs, and from them flow rivers which furnish hot baths, proper for all ages and sexes, and arranged according. For water, as St. Basil says, receives the heating quality when it runs along certain metals, and becomes not only hot, but scalding. Britain also has many veins of metals, as copper, iron, lead, and silver. It has much and excellent jet, which is black and sparkling glittering at the fire, and when heated, drives away serpents. Being warmed with rubbing, it holds fast whatever is applied to it, like amber. The island was formerly embellished with twenty-eight noble cities, besides innumerable castles, which were all strongly secured with walls, towers, gates, and locks. And, from its lying almost under the North Pole, the nights are light in summer, so that at midnight the beholders are often in doubt whether the evening twilight still continues, or that of the morning is coming on. For the sun in the night returns under the earth, through the northern regions at no great distance from them. For this reason the days are of a great length in summer, as, on the contrary, the nights are in winter. For the sun then withdraws into the southern parts so that the nights are eighteen hours long. Thus the nights are extraordinarily short in summer, and the days in winter, that is, of only six equinoctial hours. Whereas in Armenia, Macedonia, Italy, and other countries of the same latitude, the longest day or night extends but to fifteen hours, and the shortest to nine. This island at present, following the number of the books in which the divine law was written, contains five nations, the English, Britons, Scots, Picts, and Latins, each in its own peculiar dialect cultivating the sublime study of divine truth. The Latin tongue is, by the study of the scriptures, become common to all the rest. At first this island had no other inhabitants but the Britons, from whom it derived its name, and who, coming over into Britain, as is reported, from Armorica, possessed themselves of the southern parts thereof. When they, beginning at the south, had made themselves master of the greatest part of the island, it happened that the nation of the Picts from Scythia, as is reported, putting to sea in a few long ships, were driven by the winds beyond the shores of Britain, and arrived on the northern coast of Ireland where, finding the nation of the Scots, they begged to be allowed to settle among them, but could not succeed in obtaining their request. Ireland is the greatest island next to Britain, and lies to the west of it. But as it is shorter than Britain to the north, so on the other hand it runs out far beyond it to the south, opposite the northern parts of Spain, though a spacious sea lies between them. The Picts, as has been said, arriving in this island by sea, desired to have a place granted them in which they might settle. The Scots answered that the island could not contain them both. But we can give you good advice, said they, what to do. We know there is another island, not far from us to the eastward, which we often see at a distance, when the days are clear. If you will go thither, you will obtain settlements, or, if they should oppose you, you shall have our assistance. The Picts, accordingly, sailing over into Britain, began to inhabit the northern parts thereof, for the Britons were possessed of the southern. Now the Picts had no wives, and asked them of the Scots, who would not consent to grant them upon any other terms than that when any difficulty should arise, they should choose a king from the female royal race rather than from the male, which custom, as is well known, has been observed among the Picts to this day. In process of time, Britain, besides the Britons and the Picts, received a third nation, the Scots, who, migrating from Ireland under their leader, Ruda, either by fair means or by force of arms, secured to themselves those settlements among the Picts which they still possess. From the name of their commander, they are to this day called Dalrudins, for, in their language, Dal signifies a part. Ireland, in breadth and for wholesomeness and serenity of climate, far surpasses Britain, for the snow scarcely ever lies there above three days, 
No man makes hay in the summer for winter's provision, or builds stables for his beasts of burden. No reptiles are found there, and no snake can live there. For though often carried thither out of Britain, as soon as the ship comes near the shore, and the scent of the air reaches them, they die. On the contrary, almost all things in the island are good against poison. In short, we have known that when some persons have been bitten by serpents, the scrapings of leaves of books that were brought out of Ireland, being put into water and given them to drink, have immediately expelled the spreading poison and assuaged the swelling. The island abounds in milk and honey, nor is there any want of vines, fish or fowl, and it's remarkable for deer and goats. It is properly the country of the Scots, who, migrating from thence, as has been said, added a third nation in Britain to the Britons and the Picts. There is a very large gulf of the sea, which formerly divided the nation of the Picts from the Britons, which gulf runs from the west very far into the land, where, to this day, stands the strong city of the Britons called Acluith. The Scots, arriving on the north side of this bay, settled themselves there. Mm -hmm.